I'm Stephen Foskett, the organizer of Tech Field Day, and we are here in lovely uh, Silicon Valley for Storage Field Day 11. The video you're about to see is a discussion between a panel of invited uh, social media influencers, bloggers, podcasters, writers, speakers from around the world who came together with interesting companies in their space to listen to presentations, but also to interact. If you'd like to be part of this, please go to techfieldday.com. You can learn more about becoming a presenter or a delegate at a future Tech Field Day event. You can also find videos like this one on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash techfieldday. It's pretty exciting today to talk about uh, a lot of the storage industry and where things are going. And, and certainly, uh, most recently, with the uh, WD, uh, Western Digital Corporation's acquisition of SanDisk and also uh, the integration of uh, HGST as well, certainly now we're pretty much the largest storage company in the world. Um, there's a lot of things changing, and I see a lot of familiar faces in here. You know, Curtis is an example, read a lot of stuff over the years, and uh, for some of this, well, most of us who have got the bits of gray in the room um, certainly have been around to see a lot of changes evolve over time. And some of this uh, that I'll share in the beginning, you'll see is a little bit of a tongue in cheek as well in terms of reflecting on what we've done as an industry going forward. So um, really we're gonna go through here. I'm gonna touch a little bit on uh, the possibilities of data. And then I, I'm joined with uh, two colleagues who are both architects um, from various backgrounds. I'll let them introduce themselves. But again, architects that have been looking at uh, how storage has evolved at massive scale as well as the performance needs uh, that people are really asking for. So um, my name is Gary Ling. I uh, run marketing for the Data Center Systems BU at Western Digital Corporation. Uh, previous to that, SanDisk, obviously, and uh, I've had various stints, uh, whether it be EMC, NetApp, uh, Veritas, and other companies. But sort of really, we're seeing a rapid change in the world of storage. Um, it's really changing, you know, I would say weekly or at least yearly in terms of new architectures, new things that are going on. When you see, look at um, some of the analysts, whether it be 451, IDC or Gartner, various people are talking about the things, whether it be the third platform or whether it be Gartner's nexus of things. They're all talking about kind of looking at mobile, cloud, big data, big data analytics. And obviously some people talk about big data and they're thinking, oh, that's just analytics. And, you know, certainly content repository sounds a little bit more interested in big buckets uh, of content. Um, but really there's a lot of data being generated and you have to be asleep at the wheel uh, to, to not realize how fast data is growing. Um, certainly now it's billions of people and millions of apps. Um, certainly everyone's generating the, the, uh, the amount of content out there. And Steve, you mentioned earlier, was it thousands of videos, 2,000 videos? Well, certainly that's a lot of storage, but also that's a lot of network traffic. So in terms of the amount of data growth, and some of this is obvious to some of us, but really sort of it comes down to why are we doing this? You know, what, what's our belief in terms of what we can actually do with information, to store information faster than ever before, to transport information uh, faster than ever before, and really what is the end user impact? So all too often we're sort of building technology to fix technology. You know, why did we invent RAID? Why did we invent certain different file systems to do certain things? It really is a matter of not just scaling to terabytes or petabytes or even exabytes, but really scaling beyond, providing information on demand and ensuring simplicity. All too often, well, again, we're building this technology to fix technology and then you get feature creep, you get additional technologies, and then you have this large environment that's hard to scale and certainly quality of service really matters. But now it's about the quality of service down to the end user. We talked about, I you know, hicked up a term the other day about consumer price, almost like the end users are driving the demands of the data center. Um, it used to be, you know, 10, you know, 20, 30 years ago, it was all about MIS and data centers and long reports and in the Oracle application. Well, now it's a matter of fast, how fast I can provide that video to that endpoint device. Otherwise, I'll lose that end user and that experience. So it really comes about at the impact. And when you start to look at what have we done through the years, I'm not too sure everyone in the room has worked on mainframes, although I did once or I saw one. Um, but, you know, where to go from mainframe and some supercomputers, look what we've done. We've, we get start with consolidating everything being centralized around a mainframe. Then we say client server. And I think most of us were in the room when we were all banging the drum around uh, various databases and doing client server approaches. And then it was like, so that was more 
decentralization, and then we go virtualization, and we centralize it again. Now, what are the challenges of the data center is actually managing the amount of VMs and the, how that starts working. And then when we start to look at the real scale, the scale that we've, we've been faced with and some of these two architects here have had to deal with on a daily basis in terms of scaling the amount of petabytes of information and delivering that to the right, level of ser the right service level, we've now got uh, hyper-converged infrastructure, converged infrastructure, and many of the large you know, uh, hyperscale vendors whether they be Web 2.0 or whether they're actually running different services, are looking at disaggregated or have actually deployed disaggregated storage and compute to get the level of scale in performance as well as, as, well as capacity. And then we start to look at things, whether it be big data and fast data, you know, we talk about all these different scaling points, you know, oh, well, I can have a 20 petabyte cluster. So what? It's a matter of going beyond that. Geo-distributed is now the norm. You know, multiple in multiple applications, you've got vendors that are collaborating on, you know, uh, video and um, various things, whether there's an office in India and in the UK and in California, and not being able to transfer that information continuously to the right service level. So you need things like object storage um, to store and deliver that information efficiently. And the word archive, I don't like too much because it's very subjective. You know, how long am I going to keep that information? How quickly do I want it back? What are the access rights? And is it millions of people infrequently or a few people very frequently? And am I going to keep it for 32 years as one of the uh, defense organizations work? They say we keep it forever, which actually means, I think, 32 years, which is the longest time you can be in one of the, one of the services. But all of this is really sort of changing the dynamics of, where, um, of, of data and, and the way it's being stored. And then when you start to look at, you know, some of us, have, we've been around a while, yeah, the storage management, the ones and zeros, but really goes from the data to the information. And some of us have been around probably, what was it, 12 years ago when we were talking about ILM, um, information lifecycle management. I remember talking to um, a customer at Trade Show, he comes running up to me and says, I'd like to buy an ILM, please. And, you know, really thinking it was a product or a SKU, but it really is a strategy about understanding your information, understanding its value, and how do you turn uh, data to information, information into knowledge, and then ultimately into wisdom and, and predictive analytics. But the amount of information that's growing is, is, is kind of crazy. Uh, but the, the highlight is, look, this is the amount of useful data out there. And then you start to look at, well, you know, how much capacity shipments are there. So clearly a new solution is kind of required if we've got capacity shipments down here, useful data up here, and other data like, for example, in, Internet of Things where I'm accessing it and pulling it through and they're making decisions. So certainly new solutions are required um, to address this kind of capacity growth and to deliver the information to its service level. A couple of the, the, the analysts as well, and some of you have also used some of this speak, which is, scale up and scale out. You could argue that scale up is second platform and scale out is third platform. It depends who, which analyst report you're reading. But if we look at some of this environment where it's been very IT centric, it's been very much about RAS, you know, reliability, availability and scalability, and very much infrastructure centric. Uh, typical are, uh, are environments of, of, uh, of typical storage vendors. And then sort of scale out. You know, certainly there's been a lot of scale-out system vendors providing scale-out file systems, but even those have boundaries and limitations. And then you have the human nature of, oh, I can have a, a 20 petabyte cluster. Well, if I need to update that something, then I need to take down the cluster. That's not very uh, useful anymore. So really we're looking at certainly the agility, the scale-out. We've got new trends in terms of software-defined data centers, software-defined storage. What does that really mean to the end users, the customers, whether they be the at scale enterprise or whether they be the cloud service providers and, and certainly the systems integrated and VARs delivering on these services. So I think if you listen to Gartner as well, they'll even talk about this could being called bimodal IT and actually bring in some of the value from both sides of this scale up and, and scale out architecture. And then, so if you kind of look at where um, Western Digital is going, it really is kind of growing from, you know, right down at the lowest level in terms of delivering the media. The hard drive systems, the solid state drives, um, and even the, certainly the memory. 
um, case in point, you know, what would happen if we, if we didn't have flash? You know, we'd be sitting there with uh, probably the big phone that the guy from Vegas used to have and the big aerial sticking out because of the capacity. But look what that certainly enabled. Um, last year, we introduced a SanDisk, a product called InfiniFlash, which was the first half a, a petabyte storage system with, you know, two million IOPS. And that's transformed a lot of deployments and a lot of architectures with a reduction in power and cooling and, and the level of density and less racks. So it really starts to transform the way that the people are building out those architectures. And Rourke Hillerman will talk a lot more about some of the platforms there. And then certainly when you start looking at even the hard drive platforms, the level of capacity and capability that these are now providing <coughs> really affects the ability to scale services, both performance and capacity. Certainly there's the object storage software. Um, a, a little while ago, um, you know, HEC purchased Ampler Data, which was a market leading, or is a market leading object storage uh, software platform, and has been tightly integrated to deliver an all-inclusive um, system that people can actually store information on. And then really looking at the difference between file, object, and block, and how this is actually moving forward. You know, in the hyperconverged, people are talking about UFOB, or Unified File, Object, and Block. Why would you want to put all three of those in one system? I, I don't know. But certainly file and object are coming very close together and it's a matter of being able to read in with one and store it efficiently and deliver it to it certainly as value. So really sort of delivering unmatched value through all these different broad, broad points and the innovation that we're doing down at the SSD level. So even providing APIs so you can actually change things like user provisioning and actually scaling the level of, uh, of uh, applicability of that particular device. So we sort of, one of our visions here and what our core belief is that, you know, we make possible happen. And the possibilities are, are certainly the, the ripple, fe ripple effects of the performance and the scale capabilities, providing insights and the machine learning. And, and actually, if you look online, there was a, a bunch of stuff that we did recently in, in artificial intelligence and machine learning um, with Bloomberg. So when you start looking at this, you know, the innovation, the big data and complex tasks become a lot more feasible and enable new possibilities and new applications. Certainly at the data center bottom line, for those of you who remember the HP days about talking about BCNA and ITC, business continuity and availability and IT consolidation, it's a continuous journey to get more and more out of the infrastructure, to consolidate, to expand, to consolidate and expand. But if we can do that efficiently, God forbid the actual data center uh, IT guys can actually focus on supporting and driving the business. And then in terms of being able to you know, provide the information down even to the medical environment, and as well as certainly video surveillance. The video surveillance has <laughs> got a lot of noise recently, and we've got leading solutions inside WDC um, providing that. But in terms of commercial video, su video surveillance, um, what about beyond just the, kind of the, the, the obvious threats? But what about being able to do real-time facial recognition with endpoint cameras in HD? And then being able to look up that person's purchasing history so as they walk past that favorite shoe shop, they get the, uh, the Groupon coupon for Jimmy Choo shoes at 20% off. Now don't take that as gospel because I don't think that's a real offer and Jimmy Choo never discounts, <clears throat> so I'm told. But um, they're the kind of applications that people don't think of um, before because they just were too cost preventive and the applications and the services and the performance just simply wasn't there.